is this. And in this space, as we come together as the Hood family, in our annual Ruben L. Speaks Endowed Memorial Lecture Series. And said lecture series is named in honor of the late Reuben, Bishop Reuben Lee Speaks, who was a gifted African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church leader and acknowledged in a number of different ways and occasions for his leadership and his creative engagement in ministry. And Speaks received the Chancellor's Award from the University of North Carolina at Wilmington and the Distinguished Citizen Award from the Brooklyn Advisory Committee of the New York Urban League. And this year's featured speaker and presenter is the very, the very well-known, the Reverend Dr. Teresa L. Fry Brown, the Brandy, the Bandy Professor of Preaching at the mm -hmm. Candler School of Theology at Emory University. The chair she holds is a coveted shared professorship that many consider the country's premier chair in homiletics. And I was delighted to first meet Dr. Fry Brown when she arrived at Candler in 1994, when I was enrolled in the Master of Divinity program there. And I was fortunate enough to sit at her feet and truly learn from a true homiletics master in her second homiletics class as her student. And in 2010, she became the first African-American woman to attain the rank of full professor at the Candler School of Theology. Dr. Fry Brown is an itinerant elder in the AME Church, where she holds the distinction of serving the connectional body as one of its general officers as the historiographer and the executive director of the Department of Research and Scholarship. And so in tonight, I am delighted to present to the Hood family and community, my homiletics professor, the Reverend Dr. Teresa Fry Brown. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm going to try to share my screen, but first let me just say that I am grateful to have been able to be invited tonight, and hopefully everything will work out all right when we start doing this. Uh, I've been thinking about a lot of things. I've, this is a great opportunity for me because I've taken on the job of being the academic dean, and I don't want you to see that piece. There we go. Now you can see my screen, right? Not my notes, just my screen. Somebody help me. Thank you. There we go. Um, taking on the role of the academic dean. So I haven't taught for a little bit. So this will be another wonderful opportunity for me tonight. So one of the things that I'm very interested in and have been for the last three years, particularly in the field of homiletics, is tired voices. Uh, so many of the preachers that I've worked with, whether it's at the school or other places in the United States, are very, very tired. Uh, they had to pivot when they didn't know they could pivot, and they're not, they, they've kind of lost who they were supposed to be. So tonight, I want to talk about fatigued voices, and tomorrow I want to talk about transformative voices. So we get both ends of that for me. Um, when we think about where we are and all the things that are facing those of us who are in ministry, whether we call ourselves proclaimers or witnesses or lay preachers or preachers, all of these things have taken part every day anyway, but particularly in the last couple of years when there have been this traumatic shift in what's going on, some of us are just fatigued because we had to show so much compassion and we can't seem to connect sometimes with people. Church hurt is still there. That's the number one on the hit list all the time is church hurt. There's this clone syndrome. Before COVID, when people were online, there were, I, I found that I had students that would look at someone online and then start copying everything they saw them doing because they thought that would make them better preachers if they could just be just like someone else. And they didn't understand that God has given each of us our individual voices, our individual gifts in the first place. And if God wanted everybody to be alike, I think God could have made everybody alike, but that didn't happen. And then there's this justice fatigue when things just keep happening and keep happening and keep happening and keep happening, however you describe justice, that you just get tired of hearing it. There's some nights I can't even watch the news because I'm thinking, here's one more thing that we have to deal with. I thought we did this 30 years ago, but here's one more thing. Makes our voice a little tired. Fear of success and fear of failure. That's some personal things that preachers go through all the time, proclaimers. It, it's, you think you put all your effort into it, you're doing your best, and then it doesn't quite seem to be what you think it should be. Uh, there are a lot of angry preachers out there. 
I know there's some in the biblical text, but there are a lot of angry preachers. They're just mad. They don't know why they answer the call. They don't know why they have to show up for anything. They're just tired and mad. And it seeps through in their sermons all over the people that are supposed to be listening to them. And we have unmanageable stress. I, I, uh, I uh, believe in God. I believe in prayer. And I have a therapist because there's some things that I can't tell other people, but I will pay $25 copay to have somebody listen to me and keep my confidences. And I've become healthier the last two years because I've been able to unpack some things that in some cases I've been carrying with me all my 71 years, right? Then there's this spiritual and emotional exhaustion that I hear in people's voices sometimes. We have prayed, we have lost, we don't know what's going on and we keep get being hit by things, spiritual exhaustion, some of us have health concerns and the social political can be so overwhelming and divisive at times. These things come out when we approach what we're supposed to do as proclaimers of the word. Some of us as preachers, as proclaimers, as witnesses have these physical, we're just exhausted all the time. We have difficulty sleeping. We have emotional kinds of symptoms where we're irritable and we feel guilty about things or a sense of helplessness. How am I going to reach out and help my congregation? We have behavioral symptoms where we can be very aggressive or pessimistic or defensive. We can even, I don't, I don't know if you've experienced this, but sometimes burnout is seen by preachers that just run in, preach and go back out. They wanna avoid their congregations at all costs, whether they're online in those cute little boxes or they are in person work-related things, we understand that there are, depending on which, on which report we read, that some 1,700 people a year, and some people say 300 a month, but we're gonna go with the lower number right now, leave ministry because they just feel overwrought. They walk away because they try their best and somebody's always critiquing them. Uh, they take a risk and it's not the risk that the congregation wants and all of that oozes out of them when they stand in a pulpit. And then there's interpersonal things that sometimes get to us that start weakening our voice and we withdraw and we, we don't have a sense of humor anymore. And then we may resort to dehumanizing people that we don't understand. I think that it's something to really pay attention to when preachers who are supposed to speak life-affirming words start using death-dealing words with their congregations or with other people. There are all kinds of crises around us, so I don't have to go into this, but I think it's important to understand that sometimes when we start having debates about who's rich, who's poor, who's Republican, who's Democrat, blah, 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 we forget that there are some external crises and things going on, but a lot of internal things, as I was talking about. And 10% of our congregation is in crisis every week, wherever you are, 10%. And most of the time, because we're in pastoral positions, we don't take care of our own stuff because we care for everyone else. And fatigue sets in and the crisis can be internal where we start thinking that there's nothing to be done about anything, it's not my fault, or external causes, like someone else is causing it, it's unavoidable all kinds of things go on, it impacts our preaching voice. The other thing when I think, particularly in listening to preachers these last few months talk about the United States is so divided, I don't think we'll ever get back together again. I think that we don't read the room well and understand that every the culture is the sum total of who we are. It's what we know, it's where we've been, it's, it's our DNA, it is what neighborhood we're in, where we went to school, what sorority fraternity we're in, what we eat, what we listen to. So the surface kinds of things you see are like music and games and language, but all that stuff that's underneath that you see, this impacts how we, we share a word, how we're able to be civil to each other. Things like the, our facial expressions, um, I might say that, that there are people who are not taught to look other people in the eye. My mother demanded that I do so. There are people who look at a facial expression and they'll read one thing, but you're thinking something else. There are uh, personal space issues. Who's touching me? It's, it's the way that we are taught to handle our emotions. I, I had this discussion uh, earlier this week with a group of students in that because I'm the only one in the capacity that I'm in now at the school, the first one, people can't read me because they could read me in a classroom, but they don't know in a boardroom. 
And so if I'm not talking a lot, I must be angry. But if I'm talking, I must be angry. And so people can't really read that because they, they subsist on stereotypes about the other instead of getting to know the people in a pastoral sense that we're supposed to know. There, there, there's different ways that we have manners or how we do leadership. There's, there's this different way we talk about family and justice and fairness. There are a lot of attitudes that come up sometimes about elders and dependents and what authority is and what cooperation is and competition. And God deliver me from preachers who always feel they're in competition with someone else. You probably don't have this where you are, but here in Atlanta, there are preachers that set up, you would think that they're playing football or something. It's who has the biggest one, has the most people show up, who's the flashiest, who does all these things, and God gets lost someplace in that equation. And that becomes critical when we talk about sharing a word for God. Sometimes I have to talk with people about the ability to read the room. My grandmother taught me this, read the room. When you enter into a space, when you enter into a pulpit, when you enter into a church, when you enter into a classroom, do you read the room or do you expect everything to change because you showed up? Do you know the culture, the history, the beliefs where you are? Are you aware of the differences that people that are really, because God made us differently, should be assets and not liabilities? Do we know the history of the place that we are as a historian? So I'm, it's very important that I know the history of the Amy Church. I know you know all the history of the Amy Zion Church. And I, know, I saw Dr. Uh, Grant on, she knows history of everything, that you know the awareness and impact that history is. And, and where am I reading it from? Um, when I hear people say we're marginalized, I always want to say, who put me on the margin? Because in my life, I'm, in the, I'm where I'm supposed to be. So my perspective may not be your perspective, but it's still my perspective. How am I experiencing stereotyping or microaggressions? When people will say something that, that hits you the wrong way and they'll say, I didn't mean to, but they keep doing it, that's a microaggression. How do I tolerate difference? In the biblical text, there's difference everywhere, but how do I, as someone that says, I believe in God, that I believe in Jesus, how do I tolerate difference or do I want to blot out difference? And who gave me the authority to try to kill off everything that's not like me? That comes into play. What is my language proficiency? This does not mean that we pretend to know Greek and Hebrew and Aramaic. It means, do I understand people when I'm talking or when they're talking to me? Can I interact with people from different cultures and not think that mine is better than theirs, whatever it might be? Can we meet on some common ground that we can share information together? Can I appreciate the way you wear your hair and not tell you you shouldn't wear it that way? Can I appreciate that you eat something that I don't eat, that you listen to a different music than I listen to? Can I appreciate you because you're a child of God all of that comes out in our communications in our classrooms, in our communications at the restaurants, in our communications on the sidewalk, wherever. Am I aware of how much technology influences what I believe? How, how we are pictured in technology? Who's the one that always wins? Who's the one that always has wealthy clothes? Who's the one that always has a good family? Who's the one that I always think is very interesting, and this is nothing against Catholicism, but I have to put that out there. In the majority of procedural dramas on television, the police are always in the Catholic church. So I guess that means that Protestants are only the ones that cause the problems, but everybody else is in the Catholic church. So I look at that sometimes, I think, well, you know, I grew up at a Baptist church and we did okay. So, you know, think those kind of things through. How are we pictured? How, how are we, what, what roles are we playing? Because when people are listening to us preach, those roles come with them into the sanctuary. The culture comes with them in the sanctuary. Because even though people try to separate sacred and secular, you can't do that. The difference is we cross a threshold and say Jesus louder than what we did on the other side of it. So we're still bringing our whole being and everything we've gone through during the week into the worship experience, wherever it might be, okay? We already know that preaching is this, this act of public speaking, this karigma, talking about the death, life, the, the birth, the life, the ministry, the death, resurrection, and promise parousia of Jesus. We understand that. 
in the ways that we do this, the ways we use our imagination. When we are fatigued, our imagination seems to be going someplace else sometimes. When we're fatigued, our creativity needs to be unlocked. I was not able to write one word in a book during the lockdown of COVID. All my creativity just went. And I would sit and just, I would do little games or whatever, but I could not put my hands on a keyboard. I would teach a class with my creative. So it was interesting watching that rose and concrete rise as things started opening up again. Because even though I'm an introvert, I'm an introvert extrovert. So I needed some kind of contact with people, but my, 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 my imagination went down. What, what are the power sources that keep us from being fully who we are? That's the hegemonic control. How do we gather our information? Uh, one of the things that I have my students do all the time to, to spark this imagination, I'll talk about imagination again a little bit, is listen to music other than what you usually listen to. Uh, read a, read a, a, a piece of literature that you wouldn't read. I have difficulty even living in Georgia now for all these 28 years. I still have difficulty listening to country and Western music, but there's a message in it. Uh, I've explained to my students to go to chapel and listen to all kinds of preaching because there's a method in it, not just a parochial preaching that you hear every day, but go and listen to someone who's racial, ethnically, socially different than you because God is still present with them also. So that begins to break down the hege hegemony. It, it, it allows us to hear other people into speaking instead of always saying, that's not worship, God's not there. Those kinds of things become important. And so when we are fatigued, when we can't seem to find voice, when we are struggling with what we're supposed to do, where we are located, um, I don't know about you, but I didn't choose where I was called to be. God told me to go there. Uh, so the first thing I have to do when I'm about to encounter proclamation or witness or whatever is just exegete myself. Just ask myself questions. Who am I today? Am I mad at God today? Then you exegete a text because textual integrity is what is missing in too many sermons today because people will take a little bit of scripture and not read the whole story and get up and say things that make absolutely no sense. And we teach our people to say hello and amen and they haven't learned a thing. Who's the congregation that we're preaching with? Who are the people that God has assigned this to? Where is our priestly voice where we talk about Christian formation? Where's our prophetic voice? And I'll talk about that tomorrow, where we're mediating the voice of God's activity to transform the world and society and church. And where's the sage voice? We live in a culture that loves youth, but what about the sages, the people that have been through some things? I was laughing the other day, I used to direct choirs and I, and I have an eight month old grandson and we were talking about songs to teach him. And I said, Deliver me when they teach two-year-olds to saying I'm coming up the rough side of the mountain. They cannot spell mountain and don't know what rough is, but we'll teach them these songs as if that's what they're, they're, they're supposed to live through. Who is the congregation? Who am I present with? Who's my community? And how often does community change? We have moved away from uh, the church being in the midst of a community in many most people have to drive in or walk in or something of that. But who do I say are my community? How old are the people in the church? And not assuming that because they're over a certain age, they, don't, they know everything about God now. But we have found in research is they have the same questions that young people have, the same embarrassment level that young people have, the same issues with mortality that young people have. Who are those people? And what in the world is going on in the world? Not just what we see on nightly news, but am I as concerned with the people in a continent that I've never visited as I am with people on my block? That's the world. That's the entirety of God's creation. And I don't have creation, but also that should be included in the exegesis of the world. We should not have to argue over climate change. Never mind, I'll talk about it tomorrow. We were given dominion, not dominance. So I'll talk about that tomorrow. And do we follow up? Can you stand on what you've just said? Whether you are teaching or speaking or having conversation, can you follow up on what you have just said to someone? Or do you say it and then run? 
There was a little thing about throwing a rock and hiding your hand. I think something like that. Uh, there are some people that will preach something, tear people apart, and then walk out and go to their office, but will not stand on the word they supposedly just received from God to share with people. Uh, that means you have a cowardly voice, not just a tired voice. So here's some questions to ask yourself. Who in the world is God for me right now? What do I really believe? Not what I was told to believe, but what do I really believe right now? What is my image of God? Who, how, do I, how do I tell people about God? Am I using the same names all the time? Who is spirit for me? Who is Christ for me? What promises have been actualized in my life? that I can share in my faith, not bragging about cars and, and houses and money in the bank, but what are the promises of God? Um, when I was an older mother, so when I had my daughter at age 31, I asked God to allow me to see her graduate from high school. God allowed me to see her to graduate from high school and college and a master's degree and a PhD and now has her own child. That's a promise of God that is not in dollars and cents. God gave me health. Because sometimes we forget to pray for health because we're so busy wanting to have things that are tangible. But health can be one of those. How is God active in my life? What are my hopes? These things you ask. What makes me angry and disappointed in my life? And can you, as a preacher, critique yourself and say, you know, I flunked that one. That one, I know I didn't put enough work in, and this is what happened because I didn't do the work. Can you do that? Are we all the most brilliant preachers that there possibly are? And I know you're all brilliant, so I won't even go there. Okay. We've already done those, but what are your sacred texts become critically important also? There are, for me, the sacred text is in, in my denomination, in the AME church, I cannot preach from the Apocrypha or the um, Testament of the Patriarchs. I have to use what is the Old Testament, what we decided, somebody decided, some committee decided, I wasn't there, I wasn't alive. Old Testament, New Testament, even though now they're called uh, First and Second Covenants, right? They're called different things. But for me, is that my sacred text? I have people come up and say, this song is my sacred text. What my grandmother said is my sacred text. This movie is my sacred text. What exactly uh, allows you, enables you to talk about God, to share about God? Are we going to argue over translations forever? And we're losing people because we don't understand that somebody's sacred text may maybe someone just saying, you're going to be all right. And they keep saying that over and over and over again. And if we go through it, then we will see that's still a promise that's in the Bible, right? Who do I talk to about what I'm doing? Am I, am I, am I so self-centered that I cannot share concerns or ask questions with someone in my creative process? That becomes critical for everyone to do. And so when we are tired, the imagination, I told her I'd come back to this, becomes critically important. What is your imaginative being doing when you're fatigued? Conventional imagination can be something that we gain from listening to other preachers or listening to hymns or prayers or traditions. It doesn't mean you try to preach like them, but it may give you a spark so you can keep going. Emphatic imagination is you, you try to put yourself in someone else's shoes, not to become them, but imagine what it might be like for someone or imagine how it might be for that biblical character or something of that nature is emphatic. Visionary involves the ways that you can see some newness in the world, some new things that God is doing. Sometimes we lock God in a box and we forget that God is a still moving, acting, creative being God. So what is something new? What is a surprise for you that you now want to share with someone? And then we have moral imagination, which I'll talk about in the morning. Moral imagination is a concept from the early 70s. Well, actually from the 17th, 1790, moral imagination from uh, Edwin Burke, where it means that 
that we use our imagination to generate and recollect new social and moral ideals, new traditions, how we think differently about human nature, how we cultivate, how we see other people is our moral imagination. So it also means that we don't try to kill everybody but ourselves, right? That's moral imagination. And so when we are locked in this fatigue, there's some attentiveness that I think that we don't do a lot of. The attentiveness means not just the text and the listener, but the attentiveness means, am I paying attention to everything around me? I, am, am, I, am I paying attention to everything around me? Have I, do I have the ability to stop talking? I know preachers are supposed to talk, but can you just stop sometime? Just, I'm trying to get my words together so I don't say shut up, but anyway, can we just, close our mouths and just listen to the sounds of nature around us can we relax rest is a sacred is a sacred text rest to focus can we can we try to limit the distractions around us and actively listen can we be can we practice patience can we check our personal prejudices because we all have some can we check our personal prejudice? Can we listen to the tone and the volume of the people who are speaking with us and not try to preempt what they're about to say to us? Can we start attending to all the ideas and words in the world and watch for nonverbal cues? Can you watch for nonverbal? The, 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 if the windows are the eyes of the soul, the, the, the eyes are the windows of the soul, What's being reflected when you watch someone else, when you attend to someone other than yourself? Can you see humanity in someone else and a spark of life that may, in fact, make us more responsive to everything around us? One of the things that has happened in the last few years, but I know it happened before because I've worked with lots of preachers who have burned out, is that what success and productivity is has to be reassessed and refined. It doesn't mean numbers on a belt. It doesn't mean engagements. It doesn't mean honoraria. It doesn't mean the size of church, but what is success and productivity for you? How do we contextualize around us? Can we read, I'm back at the reading room, can we, can we think about where we are, why we are, and what is it that God wants us to do here and not always look for our next assignment? Can we find our comfort zone? One of the, one of the issues that I work with, with uh, preachers during COVID is they spent so much time on the presentation, they forgot about the text because they had to be the producer and the sound person and the, and the person that made sure the lighting was good and that they had at least a shirt on at the top, even if they may have been in pajama pants, pants at the bottom. And, it, and they could not find that zone because they started doing so much stuff that they couldn't even focus on the sermon. And this happens on Sunday mornings when people are back in because people are managing so many things, they forget that the central thing that they're responsible for is the word of God. So how can we talk about God will take care of you, rest in the Lord, and we're running around like the proverbial chicken with our heads cut off. And we want everything to be perfect because after all, I'm on, I'm live streaming. After all, on Facebook Live, after all, it's going to be on YouTube. Everything does not need to be posted on YouTube or live streamed. Sometimes I believe God is saying, it's only for the people right there. So back up and leave it alone. What is the language that we're using when we're tired? Does your language become more flourish when you're tired or does it become very pedantic when you're tired? Do you become short with people when you're fatigued? Or are you able to hold a civil conversation with people? When you are tired, do you remember to explore your ecclesial doctrine and polity and belief and theology? Do you know what it is? I've had students in my class and I would say, what's the theology of your denomination? I don't know. 
Did you go through the board? Yeah, they never asked me. But what is the belief system? What do you believe? What do they believe? What is the doctrine that you're following? Because the other thing that has been happening in the culture, when I was talking about culture, is there's been this bleeding over and people are running and picking up something they see on social media and bringing it back to what to, to their own denomination and they don't even test it against the denomination. So it adds some fracture to it. So I think it behooves everybody to know exactly what you believe. If it's not written down, ask somebody. We're doing that in the Amy Church now, working through some things that have not, we have not had a written theology. We use the Apostles' Creed. We use the Articles of Religion, but we do not have a functional theology that says this is, on the websites, they have all, if you go through all the AME, I know AME Zions have this down pat, but if you go through all the AME, AME Church websites, they will have a different theological statement. Hmm. So what do we believe as a denomination? How much is popular culture taking over what we are doing inside of the church? How much do we rely on somebody else, how they dress, uh, how you're, I, I think it's very interesting that there are all these YouTube clips or reels of people shouting. Um, and so I must have missed something because in my education in the church, the spirit told you when to shout, not a, not a recording, right? So they're teaching people how to shout. They have shout schools and people spend more time on their appearance than they do what's going to happen when the spirit's there. Or people fan people and fanning keeps a fire going. But people don't quite understand that. I mean, you know, I had a science class. I guess they don't teach that anymore. But at any rate, how much are we letting culture impact what we are doing, all right? Uh, when we're in these time periods of fatigue, sometimes we have to preach out of the overflow, but it means that we have to have a habit of reading again, not just Googling something, but reading again. Uh, Pitt's library where I am has the third largest theological library in the world. And one of the librarians was on a panel with me yesterday and he said, they're having students in their third year come in and say they've never been in the library because they can Google everything. But there's something about the habit of reading, not just short facts, but really spending some time in the word, in words, in the word that helps broaden what we do in communication and religious communication um, that can spark our ideas. So yes, there's short reading and longer reading. There is um, incremental reading to reading journals and magazines and blogs and articles. Then there's that reading where you would do classical reading. And however you name classical reading, it begins to build your language base, but also your pacing. And what we also know is what you read and what you listen to is how you sound when you talk. Okay, so that kind of, and so the preaching out of the overflow means that you read novels and poetry. You might want to give yourself five or 10 minutes, morning, noon, and night to read something. Uh, that good preaching flows from experiences and associations and ideas and themes and reading dictionaries. I, I'm telling my age now, and that's really okay, but I remember when I would run on to a word and I didn't know what it meant, my mother would say, go look it up. And then I would find myself spending a whole hour in a dictionary just reading words. And now sometimes people say they go down a rabbit hole when they Google something, but there's something about the tactile sensation of turning pages and having to slow down to, to take information in that becomes critically important. So I use both of those things. I use paper, but I also use the, the internet. But what becomes important is that you have a blend of these things. So you have uh, long-term reading as shorter as well as incremental reading becomes very important to get that voice back up. I've already done that one. Okay. Uh, somebody was going to tell me how much time I have. Do I have about 10 minutes? Okay. All right. Um, one of the things, too, that I think becomes really important is spending some time with the biblical text, whatever translation you want to read. 
try to read the one that's closest to the original language. But there's something about uh, vapid sermons when I can tell when someone has not read the text. Read the text and pray over the text and say the text out loud and write the text if you have to. Listen to how it sounds, how it feels in your mouth. Uh, ingest the text. I don't mean the physical ingestion, but sit with it for a while. Uh, engage it with and without resources. Sometimes people will jump to going and finding a commentary. And I say to people all the time, I write commentaries, but commentaries are what the writer is seeing when they're looking at the text and they may know nothing about who you're preaching with. And you also need to look at who wrote the commentary. It may be someone that thinks something completely different than you do. And then I've, I've listened to people that pick the whole commentary passage up, plunk it into their sermon, and you can tell the difference in the language. All right. So do a close read of the bit. Spend some time and walk around in the text till you can't stand it anymore. Interrogate the text. Look at the political issues and the artistic renderings and, and the literary retellings and the music and the drama in the text. Um, how people study, of course, changes over time, but how do people receive the text where you are? How have they appropriated the text? I, I always think it's really interesting when people say you're not in the text. Well, unless we are ancient Judaic folks, we're not in the text. So everybody had to open it up to find themselves in it. But people start saying, my Bible says you're not in here. Well, guess what? You're probably not in the words when they were written either. So we ingested ourselves. We were grafted on, yes but we were not that story. We're all adapting the story in some place, right? We, we remix the text, we repurpose the text, we recombine the text and we play with the text in order to find some meaning that is ours. Inter ask the text all kinds of questions. What's God doing in the text? What's God doing behind the text? What, what's required for me to change and be who I'm supposed to be when I read this text? Does God want us to have any healing at all in the text? Read the good text and the texts that are not so, uh, we call them difficult texts. Uh, I'm going to go back and forth. I'll come back to that one. Never mind. Um, this way of reading the text, I know that people do these, the Bible in one year kind of thing, but this kind of reading meditation, contemplation, and prayer over the text is ancient. It's ancient. You read the text, make reflections on it, ask questions, you, you say it out loud, and, and then you, you have these conversations with God about what's going on in the text and, and meditate on how, what kind of questions are going to come up when the people hear the text, right? So these different levels of, of really being intimate with the biblical text and not just rushing in to read it when you have to write a sermon, but being intimate with the text, using all kinds of supports for the text, right? Uh, concordances, all the stuff you can find online and Bible dictionaries and commentaries, but also art and media and not rushing to look at the sermon of the week and pulling somebody else's ideas. I think too many of us spit in the face of God's call on our lives when we pick up somebody else's sermon and run with it, as if God couldn't talk to you about the same thing, right? Uh, I don't want to do that. I think I want to go to, the last thing I want to talk about, I think, is difficult texts. Uh, sometimes we are faced with a text that people spend more time arguing over than anything, but there's a way to approach a text uh, where the action of God is not what we want, but we can't just make it something different. We have to state the claim that's in the text. What's in the text is in the text. We invite the congregation to think about the complexities of the text. It's, it's like Psalm 139. I think it's 130. It might be 137. Somebody help me. By the rivers of Babylon. 137, 139. All you Bible people know it, right? But it talks about by the rivers of Babylon, we stepped down and we hung our harps on the da da da, and it goes through. And the people carried away captivity, became my song. How can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? So we'll do the first part of it, but we don't get to the last verse where it says, And now I want you to smash the baby's heads against the rocks. So we leave the difficult part out 
because we want all the deliverance stuff, but there's some difficult stuff in the biblical text that we really, really have to attend to. It's like God being violent in 2 Samuel. What does that mean? Um, there's some practices about cutting hair and castration and some other things like that are in the biblical text. There are some texts that are, that are blatant discrimination against people because of age and gender and ethnicity. There's some commands where God tells somebody to go in and kill everybody. Well, we want the touchy feely God, but war is in the biblical text, right? So these are hard things to do, but we have to address them and stop stepping around them. And one of the things that uh, Luke Powery talks about is the lament. When we are fatigued, sometimes we have to stop doing praise and worship, yeah, 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 God, rah, 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 God, and we just have to do the groans of the spirit that we make the whole worship embodied. Psalm 13 and Psalm 88 are perfect for this. It's all laid out. How long, God? And then it says, you have to trust I'm on the way in 13. Crying out for help, deliverance is coming when God defeats everything. But what we have to do is be honest that we have been through some highs and lows the last three years. We need to name our pain, use our imagination. We need to be careful with our language. We have to read the culture. We have to do prolepsis where we're foreseeing and, and um, forestalling objections in the argument. So we flash forward. We have to do amnesis where we remember things that were there in the text. We have to be direct with our language and include ourselves because preachers and pastors have issues too. You lament, the congregation laments, but when we would combine this, this experiential coming together as community and not building barriers, then we can celebrate after we have lamented. And I'm going to stop right there for tonight, for fatigue voices. Tomorrow I'm going to have you be transformative, but anyway, yes. Thank you, Dr. Fry Brown, for a wonderful presentation on tonight. We have, according to our calendar, oh, excuse me, not calendar, but according to our schedule, approximately 12 minutes for question and answer. And so to facilitate this process, I will ask that if you have a question to present to Dr. Fry Brown, um, well, with the number of voices that we have, I would just simply say, um, please enter your question into the chat. That might be the best way to help facilitate uh, moving through the various questions or pieces that you would like to uplift. No questions, yay. Okay. Wow, y'all are a quiet bunch tonight. Oh, here we go. Well, that's someone giving thanks for the informative presentation. All righty. Here comes a question. Okay. Do you find that many are resistant to change, especially, well, it left me. Here we are. Let's try that again. I can see it. Okay. Can everyone uh, see what's pr printed in the chat? Uh, Dr. Bill Chris asked, right? Yes. You find that many are resistant to change, especially in the way that the word of God is delivered. Yes. Uh, I don't think that people, what I think we need to remember, and I'll talk about this a little tomorrow, change hurts. It's uncomfortable. It, um, we, we can get into a form of living life one way and the word then starts convicting us and then people seem to be rejecting it because you're calling them on themselves, you're calling yourself to task. And I think that the most pain is when someone is talking down to someone or selecting one group of people to, to say, y'all going to hell as if we're not gonna meet them there, right? And so it's, it's, that's when the difficulty comes up and change takes, when I talk about transformation tomorrow, change means you have to give up some power. You have to give up some way of doing something. And when we become comfortable in those things, that's where the difficulty arises. It is sometimes not the vessel that's giving it, it's the words that go along with it when I was talking briefly about language. So we have to choose our words wisely. I think that the reason that Jesus used parables because he could have just gone and said, y'all stop doing that but he started telling stories 
that they could relate to, which called them then to change. That's, that's what it is. How are we dealing effective with justice fatigue? Um, I think that's part of what I'm gonna talk about tomorrow, but let me just say justice fatigue, which was a word I created about 12 years ago. And it is, um, I wonder sometimes when we talk about the exiles in the biblical text, how tired, and you know, it talks about how tired people were, they thought God abandoned them. Uh, and they would, they would want God, save us now. And it is preaching through the, the tiredness. It is understanding that um, the song says no way is tired, but I think we get really tired. It means that I have to pray that I don't have, and understand I don't have all the answers to anything. So I have to find one thing that I can think of that God is doing right now that causes me to smile and remind myself of that. Jesus talks about it in the biblical text. It says, you're gonna have stuff always. That's my translation. You have stuff always. So it's not going to be smooth and you don't slide up the side of a mountain, right? And so it's going on anyhow. So you then you, you, you stay in the anyhowness of God while you're also working for just causes. Right, you have to keep people there and understand. When I uh, I studied uh, my my doctorate's in religion and social transformation, Vincent Harding said once, um, individuals have to change before communities change. You don't just go and you don't legislate change. Individual people start changing, then they connect with somebody else that's changed, and that's how that takes place. Too often our sermons are. We're gonna go change the world. Well, that's not a reality. You change one person at a time and then ask God to connect you with the person that has, that's like-minded. The other piece is, um, we'll go through this again in the morning, but because I'm not working on sexism today and God has told me to work on, on uh, environmentalism today, doesn't mean I don't care about sexism. It means that today, this is what God told me to work on. So I'm going to let you work on that today. I'm going to work on this. And then we're going to sit down and talk about it tomorrow. But often we want everybody to work on the same thing. And that wears everybody out because it seems like we're not making any change. But so you'll hear this tomorrow. There's this interconnectedness of stuff that everything is affected by everything else. But we spend so much time blaming people about not being, you only talk about this, you're not interested in that. Well. There's some other things and not everybody can be on the front line doing something. Somebody's got to stay at home and make some money so you can take off and go protest, right? And the same thing happens in the pulpit. You cannot speak about justice every Sunday because everybody will die. You got to break it up, even if you're in the midst of something, you got to break it up and just do thank you God one Sunday and then go back to it. Trust me, it's going to be there when you get back to it, okay? That's one of the ways to deal with justice fatigue. As a lay person, because would not be able to speak about their theology and looking on a website and everybody has a different theology based on the current themes. Okay, uh, Ms. Thelma, could you help me with that? Flesh that out for me. I was just saying that it's a concern that clergy, a clergy person pastor would not be able to speak about their theology. When you ask the question, what is their theology? And they can't comment on it. And that when you looked on AME websites that everything was different. It was not a consistent view. That's what I heard you say. Maybe I oh. misunderstood. No, you can talk about your theology because when you open your mouth and say something about God, your theology is heard. What I'm saying is that sometimes we assume that in a denomination, that every church in the denomination thinks the same thing about God and they don't. Even though we say in the AME church, God, our father, Christ, our redeemer, you know, um, Holy Spirit, our comforter, and then humanity, brothers and sisters. We say that, but then in individual churches, they may not believe in brothers and sisters being part of humanity. There, there, are, there are churches that will only believe in God, but don't believe in spirit. But the denomination may say one thing, but when you go and look at individual churches, they may be practicing something else. But anytime any of us says anything about God, our theology is known by how we name God, 
about what we think God is doing, about what we are doing with God. So that becomes very transparent at the beginning. And you never have to say, this is my theology. You just start talking. If you listen to people, you can tell exactly who they think God is. It's expected on fatigue for the pastor who's serving cross racial um, My perspective on, I, I'm always very interested because I teach at, um, I'm a dean at the United Methodist Seminary, where in my head, because of my work in transformation, cross-racial appointments can be effective when you have support for being there. One of my PhD students who just graduated is that uh, she's United Methodist, and she's been placed in a church in Conyers, where the only people, the only black people in the church are she and her husband as an older white congregation. And so they have been doing this struggle with who we think each other are. And the only time there's a little change is when somebody's sick and she visits. She's only been there six months, but she's working on it. And so her DS happens to be a black male. So he's been walking with her, trying to shore her up as they're working with her being with a new group of people who have never had a black woman as their pastor before. So the struggle with cross-racial appointments is like moving into a neighborhood, moving into a job, all those other things. And sometimes we think if we say, God, everything's gonna go away, we're gonna do kumbaya from now on. No, these are still people that have to work with what they think about other people, what they've been taught about other people. So it can be very difficult if you don't have support of the person who assigns you to the church. And if you go into it thinking that it's going to be fine when you show up, it's a lot of work and vice versa too with, with white pastors in the AME church going into predominantly black churches. Uh, there, there can be some difficulty because we have not done the work before we do the appointment. Uh, Self-exegesis, uh, Ms. Jo Kathy Jones-Johnson. Self-exegesis is just ask yourself, uh, I had some questions on the thing, but just your own, is um, how am I feeling this? You know, when you wake up in the morning, just ask yourself, you wake up, how am I feeling today? What did God do for me today? What do I intend to do today? Or ask yourself that at night. When I go to the biblical text, I have to think, am I mad at God about something that happened this week? Am I really mad at God or am I mad at the person that I think God is responsible for letting them do something? When I look at this text, if I heard the text preached before and it upset me, where do I see myself in the text today? Do I even love the people? Do I care about people at all? Or am I doing this preaching thing because it's a job that I have? Am I teaching this class because I want to, or am I teaching the class because I have an agenda and now I want to make everybody believe what I believe? Those are questions that you, you could just get your own list of questions, but know that how, whatever lens, wherever your head is, when you go look at a biblical text, that's the lens that you look at the text and that's what comes out of the text for you. Or sometimes people are mad at someone, they'll go through the Bible forever till they can find a text and they say, I'm going to make that person pay. None of you have ever done that. But if you've ever heard a sermon that was ripping people apart, somebody look for some way to kill somebody with the biblical text and you can do it. That's why I think it says in James about the tongue being a mighty member, right? That we kill people with our tongues. So I think that's what's coming up there. Mm -hmm. I think that's all the questions. I, oh, here's none. How did you, oh, okay. How did I choose a therapist? I have in my family, uh, three therapists. Um, one has been practicing in Chicago for about 30 years. Um, and I have a, a, a niece and two nephew, a niece, a nephew, and two cousins. And um, when I entered ministry 40 years ago on the 1st of October, uh, when I entered ministry, there were times when I would be so upset because I would hear people say, People were being beaten at home and I'd hear a pastor say, just pray for them. Or something else was going on and it was just like, it didn't matter. And so I, I knew that I started just swallowing my voice, but I talked to my niece 
because I was going through some things. My husband died six years ago and I was feeling really lonely during COVID. I talked to my niece and she said, there's a, there's a black therapist website that she gave me. She said, you talk to the person, find out if this is a person that you can trust, a person that knows God, a person that knows that you know God, the person's not gonna tell you that you're crazy, but will just let you talk. And so fortunately for me, the first person I talked to was someone that uh, I was able to talk to these last three years. Sometimes people will go with a therapist the first time and that doesn't work. She said, just keep going until you find one that you feel comfortable enough sharing with. And again, because what was for me, licensed therapists do not share your information. And sometimes people that are pastoral care people, you will find it in the pulpit on Sunday morning and they will tell some other stuff. And it helped me be clearer about myself as a person of faith because I was able to take some junk out that was blocking my vision of the text and, and blocking my vision of the people that became my community. So that's, that's what I worked through. But she's always saying, get a therapist. And I know that sometimes people say, you don't pray. Well, trust me, I pray. I pray and I believe and I need some extra help because people that tell me I shouldn't be teaching preaching because you just open your mouth and say it are also the same people that say therapists aren't any good because it's not a God move. I believe in both of those. And I've been doing this preaching gig for a long time. So I'm gonna keep doing that. Oh, I think that uh, Dr. Barrow wants us to go home. <laughs> well, I'll see you in the morning at 11 o'clock, okay? Yeah, yeah certainly, certainly, certainly. Um, I don't want everyone to go home, but we have to leave this particular space oh, okay. um, as there are other uh, classes that we'll be meeting on tonight. Um, and so we want to thank you, Dr. Fry Brown, for a riveting conversation. Um, this has truly been a blessing for all of us, and we look forward to joining you again on tomorrow morning. Okay, everyone, um, it is time for us to uh, leave from this place, but never from God's presence. And uh, we'll see you in our respective classes, other than those who are taking supervised ministry with me. Blessings upon you all. See you in the morning. Good night. Good night.